That sounds good, thanks. So, but we'll start with Danielle, uh, who is an MA student in public history and digital humanities at Carleton University. Her current research focus is African Canadian history, and she is also engaged in a project to record and preserve heritage through oral history interviews. And our other speaker tonight is David Dean, who has been a professor of history at Carleton since 2000, where he teaches public history and British history. David earned his BA and MA at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, and his PhD at Cambridge. David is a co-director of the Carlton Centre for Public History, an organization involved with a number of cultural and heritage projects in Ottawa, including the topic of tonight's presentation, the Capital History Kiosks. David is the project lead of the Capital History Kiosk program. So, ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome our guest speakers tonight, David Dean and Danielle Mann. Right, thanks very much. Um, generous introduction and I'm just going to share my screen and uh, everyone can see that I think. Yeah. Hopefully, and yeah. uh, we'll start from here. I'm gonna minimize the speaker. Okay, so, um, well, thanks very much for uh, the introduction, Richard, and uh, thank you to everyone for inviting me to be here tonight. Uh, and Danielle, we're very grateful for the opportunity to talk about uh, capital history and the Capital History Kiosk Project. Um, I'm going to talk uh, for the first little while about the, the, the project itself, how it evolved, um, how it developed, how we've ended up with these installations, and uh, towards uh, maybe about the half hour mark, Danielle will speak about the um, a very important element, which is the capitalhistory.ca website. So um, the key elements are of the uh, a capital history kiosk or what you see before you on the left. Um, as you can see, they're, they're very striking uh, in terms of a visual image. Um, the idea is that this, this uh, sort of confronts people uh, as they're passing by, uh, entices them to come up closer, learn a little bit more about the story that's being told uh, visually through the, the, the striking image, um, but also through some text. There's the first two phases of the project all had some fairly uh, small, but nevertheless significant uh, a text panel explaining what the story was about, um, as well as some other paraphernalia like the proper credits uh, to, for, the, for the images being shown and all the, the um, sponsor's logo. But what's also important is not just the image and the story uh, that's being told in text, but also the QR code, which takes you to capitalhistory.ca uh, to learn more. And so our, our idea here with the project is that um, you'll be walking down the street, uh, you'll be sitting there waiting for the bus or standing waiting for the bus, and you'll suddenly notice this and be very attracted to it. Um, it will interrupt your day. You'll be attracted enough to come up and look at it, and you'll want to, to learn more, so you'll go onto the website to, to find out um, more about the story. And um, so it's, it's meant to interrupt people's days. And uh, we know that the, um, the project is seen by roughly 35,000 pedestrians uh, in, in downtown Ottawa uh, every summer's day, not so much in the winter's day. I think they're rushing by and not stopping to look at anything at that point. We've done about 50 installations now. There'll be 60 by the end of this month. And um, so this installation on the left is, is at uh, Bank and Homewood. And it tells the story of the fact that Lansdowne Park ended up being a barracks during the Second World War. But then after the war ended, there was a homeless situation, particularly for returned servicemen and their, their families. And so uh, homelessness activists uh, took over the barracks and renovated them. And eventually it became um, a, a place for a shelter um, an officially designated one. So it tells the story, um, a very little known story about Lansdowne Park. And um, hopefully people will learn more about that story uh, from the website. Um, so the, essentially what I'm telling you a story today is a before and after. Before there is a, a blank, empty, rather stark traffic control box at a key intersection. This one's at Main and Clegg in Old Ottawa East. And what we transform that box into is a storytelling, in this case, a storytelling of one of the wealthy families in Old Ottawa East um, who shared their family album with their, their snowshoe club. 
So they're engaging, they're enticing, and um, from what we can tell, they've been enormously successful. I want to just take you through the genealogy or the history of the project itself, um, because although officially the first kiosk was launched in 2017, there was a little bit of a backstory, and that backstory is a collaborative project between the Workers' History Museum, No History, the local research firm, Chapter One, the design firm, and the Center for Public History, of which I'm, I'm co-director along with my, my colleague John Walsh. And we, this project was essentially a workers' history museum project. I'm a, a patron and an activist with that museum. And the idea was to recover some stories of, of disappearing or, or long gone uh, businesses along Bank Street. And through No History, a researcher, public history student at Carleton MA and public history student Emily Keyes, who's now working with, with uh, No History, uh, did lots of interviews and uncovered stories of businesses on Bank Street. And uh, for the Workers History Museum, we turned this into a traveling exhibit as well as a website. Um, and some of the material there included uh, interviews with people who had experienced those businesses. So that was a sort of prehistory to um, Capital History kiosks because when Ottawa 2017 came about and the um, Arts, Culture and Heritage Investment Program put out a, a call for um, ideas to, uh, of how to celebrate Ottawa's history in 2017, the Workers' History Museum, the Centre for Public History and Chapter One Studio collaborated to put in a bid to tell little known stories about Ottawa's history on the streets of Ottawa. Um, and we settled eventually on the kiosk rather than a sort of banner. We, we originally thought we might do banners a bit like the uh, NCC ones you see all around downtown, but it proved, uh, seemed to be much uh, better for us and for the city of Ottawa um, if we decorated the traffic control boxes with these visual uh, installations. And chapter one had had experience of doing installations like this around the city. The uh, the light rail motif one. So um, we thought we would get, have a good chance. And in fact, we were one of 14 out of 120 applications that were success, successful. And this launched officially the Capital History Kiosk Project. And as you can tell from here, there are lots of partners. It was funded by Ottawa 2017, very active in, in helping sort out the stories. The Workers' History Museum, the Centre, Chapter One, City of Ottawa, obviously, because this is city property. We're essentially using a traffic control box as a canvas to tell original and little known stories about Ottawa's past. And so this has to be uh, from beginning to end. It involves City of Ottawa officials. This phase of the project involved uh, a lot of community partners and individual heritage activists and, and so on, um, but also the business improvement associations um, who, who contributed a lot of support uh, for the Ottawa 2017 project. Fast forward two years and where the National Capital Commission approached us to do stories, approached the center to do some stories um, for their anniversary. And uh, so this was funded by the NCC. And um, again, the usual partners, the Center and Chapter One Studio, led by Executive Director is Andre Mercero. Um, and of course, the City of Ottawa sponsored it, uh, but it was funded by the NCC, and we worked very closely with the NCC, as, as you'll hear. 2020, we were asked, commissioned by the Byward Market BIA, to do uh, installations in the market area. And most recently, we've done a whole series around Elgin Street. We've done 10 so far that were put in in the, in the spring, uh, paid for by the city and the Elgin Area Business Association. Uh, the uh, uh, work, person we worked with there was Halabushi. And we've just been commissioned to do another 10, and they're going to be installed um, by the end of this month. So in the end, uh, by the end of October, we should have 60, just over 60 installations across the city from Vanier in the east to Wellington Village in the west and as south as far south as Barhaven. Although the vast majority of them, for reasons that will become clear in a second, are in the downtown core. So we've essentially had four phases, a prehistory and four phases uh, over the years. And what this means is that each phase is slightly different. And so I'm going to talk about the differences, but more importantly, I'm going to stress the commonalities between um, these various um, uh, phases of the project. 
So I want to talk about process and I, I've identified just five really. What we're really, I, the story I want to take you through, the journey I want to take you through is from where we get um, from the beginning, which is a really messy, grotty uh, traffic control box full of uh, graffiti and, and um, stickers and things to the final um, image on the right where Andre Mercer and his colleagues are installing. Um, this one is the lacrosse um, story at Lansdowne Park itself. We get there by identifying locations and discovering the stories. We get there by carrying out research and creating storylines, by presenting and selecting the stories so that stakeholders and clients uh, will um, choose which stories get told. And then there's a whole process of designing them, submitting the designs for approval uh, by the City of Ottawa and by stakeholders and clients. And one that, once that's done, finally we get to the installation. So I'm going to take us through um, that process and I'm going to also um, highlight different phases of the project as, as I go along. Um, Locations were, are, were variable in terms of the ways they were determined. So for Ottawa 2017, this was done by my master's class in public history, a group of students who um, essentially were, were asked to go out into Ottawa and find a box, an empty traffic control box, a blank one, and and it's actually one that had an LRT because the city was willing to, to take those down for us on a couple of occasions. But go out to the city and, and choose a box in a neighborhood that you like, you appreciate that you've lived in or you, you work in and research some stories about those and uh, come back to us, do a presentation uh, with all the stakeholders and um, we will decide whether we're going to put your installation, the city will decide along with Ottawa 2017 um, with the with support from the BIAs and, and associations and so on. And so the students essentially had a blank canvas. The city was a blank canvas for them. Um, the only limitation is there had to be a traffic control box, which meant it had to be at a, a traffic intersection. And um, this is the reason why we have stories from Vanier to Wellington Village to, to Barhaven in this open-ended uh, location um, part of the project, of, of the first phase of this, this uh, chaos project. The second phase, the, the National Capital Commission, the NCC, of course, they had targeted, they had specific boxes, uh, traffic control boxes they wanted decorated um, or uh, um, history stories to be put on to into onto um, and this was all along Sussex Drive and Mackenzie Avenue and of course the Byward Market and the Elgin uh, Street um, ones were very targeted so these were very specific boxes in a very targeted neighborhood unlike the very first phase which was really open-ended and it was up to the students to to work what um, work their magic uh, in terms of their research and and what stories they wanted to tell. So this was an MA class in public history, um, and they um, chose their neighborhood, they researched a story, and as a result, um, they, they, there's a variety of stories that are told and a variety of approaches that they took uh, in choosing their stories. So for example, um, some of them were very sort of obvious to the student when the student uh, encountered the box um, on Bank Street, for example, there was uh, uh, the famous sign, as you all know, um, I'm sure the G.A. Snyder photography sign, the traffic control box faces that sign. So you can look at this image um, that she found of, a, it's not of Schneider's photography, but of a, another contemporary photographer's studio. Um, and you can look at the box and look at the sign at the same time um, while in conjunction with each other and, and read about Schneider as, as a photographer. Um, she encountered a local historian, Howard Simcover, who shared his story and his research Churches. He's leading a battle to save that sign and make sure it's preserved. Um, on the upper right, we have the Avalon Theatre. That was a story that had been uncovered in the Bank Street project, which, which um, was, was developed further for the kiosk project. And the story that was told there was of a strike. Um, some projectionists uh, went on strike at the Avalon Theatre and actually ended up in court because one of them struck a woman um, with, with his uh, placard. 
And um, so that's a story of told about industrial relations, but it also of strikes, um, but it also tells a story of technology because it was all about working conditions with new technologies at the Avalon. The last story, the bottom corner, um, is, is where two students went into Preston, the neighborhood of Little Italy, and interviewed, met a lot of local people and asked them what was important about their neighborhood to them. They came up with themes like uh, religion, obviously. They talked with the priest at the local church, St. Anthony and um, uh, lots of stories of, of hip from him. Um, they learned about football, obviously, um, or what we call soccer here in Canada, the, um, the importance of St. Anthony's Soccer Club to the community, and also, of course, food. So different strategies. One was very focused on the story that you could tell from the box, from a local heritage element that was right there. Another one drew from another project. And the third one was literally going into the community and talking to people in the neighborhood about what stories were important to them. And we located that story right near the Bambini um, statue of uh, sculpture, uh, public art, which is about children enjoying soccer. So the students came up with stories that were sometimes site specific, where you could literally look at the box and look at what the box was talking about. Um, gay uh, meeting places in the, the pubs and the, the bars of the Lord Elgin, in the case of the Confederation Park installation on the right. Um, a extraordinary set of um, chalk and, and other types of drawings by uh, someone who became a famous war artist um, who had visited the plant bath when it was uh, functioning, when it was opened in the 1930s. So a very uh, beautiful story there about what goes on in the building that's behind you. Others were more about the neighborhood. Um, the Cas Populaire, the original buildings in Vanier on the left have long disappeared but they were reimagined by an artist for us. And I'm more about him and, and, and that strategy uh, in a few minutes. Um, so that was the Vanier story about the neighborhood and the importance of the caste populaire to the neighborhood and the story of Jock Bell School in Barhaven, which is actually not far from where the building is, is now. And the stories were often, well, almost always little known stories. Some of them were, were better known than others. Um, the story of homelessness and the barracks at Lansdowne um, surprised a lot of people uh, who live and work around Lansdowne. I know I've talked about that one on the left already. Um, the teacher strikes after the Second World War, after the First World War in, in the Wellington area, um, was in Wellington Village area in Hintonburg was, was a very big and, and important story for the time. And that's told just outside the, um, one of the coffee places um, in, in, in Hintonburg. Often these stories were quite edgy. Um, they, they, they brought the past into the present and they made the past visible to the present, but they also had present agendas. Um, the issue of strikes, of fighting for equal wages, for equal, uh, for better working conditions, um, homelessness in the city, a major social issue, obviously, for us today. Um, and many of the stories had that sort of edginess to them, uh, which is, is something important um, for us to, to remember and, and to value. Um, little known, little edgy. And, and always insisting that we need to know about the past to, to understand our present and where we might go and decisions we might make uh, for the future. So the stories are site-specific, neighborhood-focused, and, and often little known. The, um, all of this involved research by graduate students. When it came two years later to the NCC project, um, I decided to involve my second year class, which is an introduction to public history class. This, this has 60 students in it, and we divided them into teams of, of um, six, I think. There are about 10 or 11 teams. Um, um, I couldn't have done this without um, Brianna Lester, who is the, um, my teaching assistant, who's there uh, looking at a piece of paper, standing there um, worried, uh, touching her forehead. Um, she's now a, a public history researcher here in Ottawa, and um, she was the, effectively sort of managed these groups um, for us. And um, what I love about this photograph is that um, this shows the collaboration, it shows the teamwork of the group, something quite unusual for second year students who are actually quite distrustful of, of joint projects, project work. But I love this photograph partly because they're looking at such an incredible range of sources. They're looking at artifacts, there is, uh, someone is, uh, they're looking at uh, 
records, they're looking at slides, they're looking at film strips, they're looking at secondary sources. Um, this was a project that was um, very much supported by um, the Ottawa Resource Room. Um, Monica Ferguson, who I think is here tonight, is, is the Ottawa Res uh, Collection at the McCodrum Library, which is uh, a fundamental starting point for us to tell these stories, for the students to, to do the research. Um, they, students go to Library and Archives Canada, they go to um, the City of Ottawa Archives, that's been very supportive of their work. Um, and of course, in this case, the NCC opened up all of its archives to them and brought all of these materials up for, for the students to, to, to work through. So the research process for this um, project was rather different. Um, the students had specific sites, as I, as I mentioned, the NCC gave us the, the boxes along um, uh, Mackenzie Avenue and, and Sussex. Um, the students had to research stories for those specific locations and uh, they did it in teams. So the teams had various tasks. I'd set it up so that, you know, there was a project manager, a team manager, a group manager, but there was also a designer. There was a picture researcher, visual researcher, a story researcher, a writer. Um, all of them had very specific tasks. And um, in terms of evaluation, they evaluated themselves, but they also evaluated each other. Um, and they did the research. They each came up with, had to come up with two stories, potential stories for each of the boxes that they were working on. And then they had to present the two stories. They had to make a pitch. And um, it was a bit like a Dragon's Den experience and uh, quite extraordinary for them. Because if you think about it, they're, they're, you know, there's some of the city council are there, are there, people from Canadian Heritage uh, are there, people from the NCC are there, and I, I was really, really proud of these undergraduates for just embracing this and, and, and pushing forward to this. So we ended up with uh, stories being told, um, researched and designed. Uh, again, they worked very closely with Andre Mercer in Chapter 1 in, in selecting their images and making their decisions. The images are extremely important because, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the, the, this is the point at which the public is either attracted or they just walk by without looking at it. So visuals are, are, are crucial and visuals are effectively our gateway to the storytelling that happens on capitalhistory.ca that Danielle will be taking you through uh, in a few minutes. Um, so. The students are always, whether they were the graduate students or whether they were the undergrad students, are looking for really dynamic, enticing, interesting um, visual images from the archives especially. And the archives are not just Library and Archives Canada, um, not just City of Ottawa, they can be personal archives. So the snowshoe picture that you saw earlier came from the family album of a woman uh, descendant of one of the fam big families, uh, major estates families on in Old Ottawa East. She, the student was invited in for a cup of tea and then they shared their stories going through their photo album. And uh, she was willing to let us digitize that snowshoe album. Um, the story on the upper right is actually uh, the story of lab workers, first female lab workers, uh, early lab workers at Hos Ottawa Hospital. Um, the woman on the left there is the auntie of one of the students. And so we had access to some um, wonderful material culture that we were able to showcase on our website. Lacrosse um, is, a, is a wonderful story. People don't know that lacrosse was the biggest sport in Ottawa in the 19th century. Well, my colleagues like Bruce Elliott, will, who's here tonight, will know that better than most of us. Uh, certainly, it was a bit of a surprise to me that tens of thousands of people walked down Bank Street to watch these games. Um, archival photograph and the feedback from that was that one of the descendants of one of the lacrosse players got in touch with the student um, and, and, and told stories about uh, her her uh, family member who had been a, a famous lacrosse player in Ottawa. CBC archive comes from the Strait Archives, uh, Library and Archives Canada. Um, when we can't find an archive, I will paint us back to Ottawa 17. This was particularly the case. We commissioned Ross Rayum, um, a really well-known heritage artist here in Ottawa. Um, so many of you will see his work in the City of Ottawa collection. And Ross would sit down with the student and um, the, come up with a painting. They'd imagine um, a scene. They'd tell a story to him from their researches and he would imagine the scene. Eliza um, um, Briere at the top, um, um, 
the um, bottom left, um, Philippe Cornwall, um, and on the bottom right, the Ottawa jail, um, as it would have appeared in the 19th century or could be imagined in the 19th century. Um, and this is where the design firm chapter one comes in too, because we had an archival image of the jail that just wasn't going to work well on the box. So Ross um, sat down with Sarah, the student, and, and they came up with this um, very dynamic uh, image, very powerful image. So um, the visuals are a portal to the website of Capital History. They're a gateway. They tell stories in, on them, in themselves, in and of themselves, particularly when the installation has a text panel with, on it. But um, really, it's a gateway to learn more and to hear more sometimes because we have some audio clips as well that people can get access to. When we look at the NCC installations that the undergraduates came up with, um, similar patterns as, as I mentioned earlier. There's some are site specific, um, some are edgy, some are very tell stories that students wanted to tell today um, uh, that have importance today. On the upper right, we have a pair of, of of installations from the NCC pretty close to each other. Um, Malik Karsh, the photographer on the left, um, not a little known story, but, but not quite as famous as his brother Yusuf. Um, but the, the stories of gay protests for gay rights on the right uh, at Parliament Hill, um, Mayor Friel um, and, and um, LaSalle Academy. Um, so similar patterns, some very close to the site. Um, the Dr. Vallad's house was another story that was very close to that site. Other ones are, are more uh, in the neighborhood. Um, for the, the last most two recent phases, the um, Byward Market phase, the two images in the middle, and the Elgin Street phase, two images on the left and the right. Uh, these were not done by MA students. They weren't done by um, a second year class of undergraduates. These were just done by volunteers um, who, who thought it was interesting uh, to be part of this project. But the stories are very similar. Site-specific stories about the orphan school or the petrol station that used to be on um, stories about former um, um, confectionery stores, um, Jewish, uh, Jewish business, this one, the, the Gelman business. There's an extraordinary photographer in the 1930s who went around and took photographs of Jewish business owners outside their businesses and inside the businesses, um, all of which are in the Ottawa Jewish Archive, which, which gave us access to these, and um, a, an archival image of how the market used to be. So again, specific stories, site-specific, neighborhood-specific, and sometimes a little bit edgy. Um, and that's the, the, the most recent phase. Um, once the, uh, we've got through the visuals, once we've got through the, the stories, the students have assembled their stories, they've got everything together. Then for the first two phases, the students had to present and do a sort of Dragon's Den pitch for their stories. Um, the graduate students uh, at, on the lower, lower left and um, at, at sort of uh, nine o'clock. And then the others are the undergraduates who, who presented their stories at the NCC. And so presentation and selection is very important. And of course, pedagogically, that's a really important thing to, to, to get through students through, not only the, the conception from the very beginning of, of here you have a canvas, here you have a space, what story do you want to tell? The process of selection, your story and your imagination in your, your head from conception, the research process, visuals, the importance of visuals, but also text, drafting a story so that it's enticing and interesting to readers. As many of you know, it's quite painful writing um, a 60 word text panel. Well, in fact, 30 words, because it's bilingual, so 30 in French, 30 in English. Um, um, and um, also compiling materials for the website. So what stories do you, aren't you not going to tell on the box itself, but that you're going to elaborate um, so people can learn more about the story uh, once they get onto the website. All of that's important, but so too is presenting your work and speaking in public. And that is also something that, that um, is one of my pedagogical goals through this process that we call experiential learning. Um, at Carleton, well, everywhere, um, and uh, as part of the process. Once that happens, then we get down to the the the, the basics, and the basics by which I'm, I'm by basics I mean uh, the final design by Chapter One Studio, the presentation, the submission to the various stakeholders and clients, and the City of Ottawa for approval. 
And so this is an example of three um, from three of the decks that, that Andre Mercero in chapter one produced um, for Cafe Hibou, for the NCC on the left, for um, the um, uh, LGBTQ rights movement um, on, on the right, for the Elgin Street uh, installation at Gilmore, I think it was, and um, the uh, one of the ones that you won't have seen yet, but it will be coming up, uh, be installed in a couple of weeks uh, about the trams on Elgin. Um, so the city of Ottawa needs to, to look at this very, very carefully. Obviously the stakeholders do. The NCC needed to be happy with the stories that were being told on the left. The uh, Elgin Street, uh, Elgin uh, Business Association need to be happy with the story that was being told on the right uh, and uh, in the middle. But we also needed to um, get city approval for this. And we have um, a, a link, a public art uh, person in charge, uh, um, uh, Linda Cheslick at the City of Ottawa helping us through these phases. There was someone different for the Ottawa 2017 phase. And she has been wonderful at helping us navigate permission from the city. Um, because this is city property and the city needs to clean the boxes for the installation. Uh, its traffic committee needs to be satisfied that this, the images are not going to disturb people, distract people, um, causing accidents, um, that there's enough distance around the boxes should people congregate so that they're not coming out onto the street to see a side of the box. Um, they need to know that the um, installation will not affect the functioning of the box, which means you will have noticed from some of the previous images, there are vents, there are handles, there are little um, boxes and, and bits and pieces that need to be um, accessed. Um, so there's a technical issue that needs to be supported. Um, the diversity committee um, needs to be consulted to make sure there's the, the, the certain um, criteria are being met um, by the city of Ottawa and, and language issues um, need to, the, the, everything's in bilingual, that has to be um, checked and made sure that's okay. Um, sizing of letters, coloring, all of those things, there are regulations about all of those things that need to be um, approved by various city committees. And then of course the city councillor, uh, local city councillor of the war in the ward that this is happening in uh, needs to approve it. Um, because the first person, the frontline person who's going to be confronted by a member of the public who hates this box, who thinks this story should not have been told, is going to be the sitting councillor. So we need to get city council councillor's approval of these as well. You know, the question I was, I've been asked before is why would the city bother with this? And the city bothers with it or is excited about it because it's part of their public art, art program. It's, it's about the the supporting the, the goal of beautifying the city. Um, there's, as you saw from the before and after, they can be um, quite ugly, these boxes, and, and this is seen as a, as a beautification element. But Andre and, and chapter one use a graffiti proof vinyl, which something happens to it, um, the, the graffiti can usually just be wiped away with a cloth. Um, and I know this myself because someone painted a wonderful black and white black moustache on one of the lacrosse players, uh, one of the few who was missing a handlebar moustache, and um, I was able to wipe it off. But it, actually, I hesitated because it looked, it was actually quite beautifully done. Um, so the city, um, approves these and has good reason for approving them. There are some challenges though. Um, the challenges involve repair and replacement. Um, we know they're popular because when one comes down because someone's hit it or uh, the mechanics, uh, the traffic mechanics have changed and they need to replace the box, we usually, the councillor and, and ourselves get notice of it by somebody fairly quickly to, to get it back in place. Um, and so we know that they're, they're popular that way. Um, there's a challenge for the city too, because if one part of the box gets damaged, but the other part doesn't, then what do they do? So if the door is fine, but the rest is wrecked, do they put the door back on a gray box? And, or do they migrate the door? There's, there's been a case of one of the art boxes from the downtown BIA. I think that the, the door of one of them ended up somewhere out in, in the PN, not, not where it should have been. Um, but these are issues that we, we have to navigate with the city, of course, as well. Um, and then we come to the installation once everything is approved. Um, and I'm just going to play this video to give you a slight little break for me for a second.
Okay, so as you can see, um, there's quite a lot of fiddling to do at the end, um, but installation takes about a day for each one. Each box costs about $800, including some of the costs for materials and so on. So uh, we do have uh, that, but it's all not all smooth sailing and there are some things that need to be negotiated and things that need to be navigated. Um, so for example, um, the city has some very sensible policies. It has an anti-smoking policy. It doesn't want to have any installation that uh, on city property that seems to be promoting cigarettes uh, and smoking. So we have to navigate that policy and you'll see the archival image that I used from the city of Ottawa archive at the top, advertising Winchester cigarettes. And Andre has to blank that out. Um, so we have to um, change the archival photograph, which as you can imagine is a heart-wrenching um, thing to do for a, a history that believes that you have to be faithful to the archive. Um, and uh, we can talk about that in the discussion. I, I know Andre uh, at chapter one also feels qualms about doing this, but um, this is our choice. Uh, we have to make a decision about it. We can't uh, violate um, city policy. Policy also means city policy means they can't advertise anything on, uh, on the boxes. So a business that has failed, or sorry, failed, but the business that is no longer with us is fine. But we couldn't, for example, we have a wonderful photograph of the typesetters from La Presse outside the La Presse building, uh, but we can't use that because that would be seen by this by people potentially as that the city approves La Presse and doesn't um, approve the Ottawa citizen. So uh, we can't do anything that has a contemporary business in it. Um, we have to be careful about uh, what we're commemorating. Um, in the recent Elgin Street uh, installation, we had to remove Woody Allen's name um, from the, the, um, the, the marquee on the Elgin Theatre because of the, the charges um, against Woody Allen and the allegations and, and I, get, I, I think prosecution, successful prosecution of Woody Allen. I'm not sure about that, but um, the, the, it wasn't appropriate for him to be celebrated or commemorated on city property. And sometimes we have to navigate perception. Um, the city was concerned that, and, and with all the revelations that have being had the genocide of Indigenous peoples in Canada and the, the genocide of Indigenous children, um, that um, these St. John's ambulance nurses might be mistaken for nuns outside a church and that that would uh, be provocative and it would be better not to, to have this image um, in, in our one of our installations. So this requires a lot of navigation and negotiation and, and discussion. Um, but what we hope for is that the boxes will be exciting and will be enticing and that people will go to the QR code and they will want to learn more. And so the really important element of this whole project is not just the kiosk itself, but the kiosk is a portal and a gateway to the website capitalhistory.ca. And for that, I'm going to hand it over to Danielle, who's been working on this for several months now on redeveloping our website. So I shall stop my share. Thank you so much, David. Uh, great presentation. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining me tonight. So I'm going to be discussing um, my work on the Capital History website with, with David. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so I don't want to interrupt, but while you're getting that together, Daniel, I noticed that you had sent us a chat. I guess a lot of people didn't see the video mm -hmm. that was played, they just heard it. So Daniel did send a YouTube link. So if you do want to see that video, uh, go to the chat box and she has sent a YouTube link so that you can see the video. So thanks for that, Daniel. Yeah, of course. Okay. So I'm going to discuss the process of sort of redesigning the website's um, its function and its its overall its overall design. So I'll give you a little bit of background first. Uh, so uh, the project 
the redesign project began as part of my public history uh, MA internship at Carleton with, uh, with David. Um, so I was hired by chapter one to do this redesign project. Um, I, so I don't, full disclosure, I don't have a background in web development. However, I have done a few heritage projects using digital storytelling methods. So I was familiar with the area of history telling in digital spaces. Uh, suffice it to say, the majority of my work involved me learning on the job, especially when it came to assessing the usability of the site. So I had been interested in uh, the field of user experience research or UX research. Um, so I did know kind of some of the methodologies needed to help kind of make the website more in line with project goals. Uh, so what that meant was that I was merging uh, user experience research with front-end web development. Uh, so I both evaluated uh, the website design and altered it over a period of about three months. Okay, so one of the first things that David and I did was discuss the project goals. Uh, so we had two big takeaways. Um, the first was making the connection between Ottawa's historic sites and web-based historical education clearer, more clear on the website. Um, and the second was just improving the overall usability of the website. So, um, so what I did was I assessed three areas of design on the website, navigation design, content design, and visual design. Navigation and content design were, like, are the most important areas of design, so they were excuse me, prioritized um, because content and navigation influence the simplicity, accessibility, and user-friendly nature of the site. And I wanted to show you, so this is what the website looked like before we started working on it. So you can see the menus up here um, and the stories were organized by project phase. So you would have you know, heard David talking about the different phases. Um, uh, and then there would be a little drop down here with all of the specific stories. And this is uh, another screenshot of one of the story pages. Um, so if you wanted to read about the cross at Lansdowne, you would go here and you would, you would look at the archival photos and read about that history. Okay, so evaluation. Um, what methods <laughs> were used? So this is kind of going in order. I started with a heuristics evaluation. So the purpose of a heuristics evaluation is to identify navigation and content errors or inconsistencies, if there are any present, and uh, try and fix them. Um, the, so that was done, just like an Excel sheet, um, went through all of the pages uh, and, and, and marked those and flagged those. Uh, the second thing involved uh, recruitment of participants. So I designed a card sorting exercise to improve the information architecture of the site, uh, meaning how the information was organized, um, either through like a menu operation interface um, or uh, through a map or through um, buttons, it, it depends on the, the site. So card sorting is an exercise in which participants are recruited and given web page content to sort either into predetermined categories or participant generated categories. So in this case, we had participants create categories based on the story content. Um, and this was a like a crucial exercise to understand how users might categorize the history content pages. And the result was after the exercise, um, I would group like categories that were identified and apply these suggestions, these category suggestions to 
uh, improve the IA. So for example, uh, if participants identified stories using three different labels, uh, which they usually did, um, uh, one label might be arts, the other cultural history of Ottawa, and another might be arts and culture. So those like categories were just merged under an umbrella category like arts and culture. Um, and this is a screenshot of uh, the card sort. So this is what participants would see. They would see all of these stories laid out on the side. Um, they were given instructions and then on the next page, they would uh, create categories after kind of going through these, these um, sites, the, the, the story content and, and group them that way. Um, and the last kind of methodology that I applied was usability testing, which involved uh, recruiting participants and walking them through a series of web-based tasks to test changes made to the site's content and navigation. So I conducted two rounds of testing during the internship with a total of 10 participants. And at the end of the testing period, um, I made uh, further changes to the site, uh, the website based on participants' interactions, their, their behavior with the website, with the tasks, as well as their feedback. Okay, so there were three sort of broad stroke changes that we made to the website. The first was the information architecture. So rather than organizing uh, stories by project phase, they are now organized by theme. So sports and leisure, arts and culture, um, another one, businesses, things like that. The second is navigation. So initially it just had the menu navigation option and what we did was add an open street map to the homepage. So on the map, each map point represents the location of a um, history kiosk, of one of the capital history kiosks. And the map point is embedded with a link to a story page about that historic site, about that location's history. So what the map also does, um, in like addition to being another gateway to these stories, is that it is a visual indicator to connect the online stories to physical locations, encouraging users to visit these historic sites. And finally, um, we oriented content for mobile users or mobile users. So we added instructions to the homepage to indicate uh, that mobile phone users can visit these historic sites labeled on the map. They can scan the QR code on the respective story kiosks to open the story page on their phone and read about it on location. Um, and uh, another, another way that we made the stories a little bit more accessible to mobile users was adding a quick facts section. Uh, which were added, which was added to the beginning of each story page to give web and mobile users the essential information of each story. Uh, so that was the location of the kiosk, important dates, um, you know, who lived or worked there, what happened there, things like that. And the idea is to help satisfy a wider range of users, those who work through information quickly and those who want to spend more time reading the full story. There were a lot of challenges, but I just picked two of my favorites. Um, so web development and UX design was a huge uh, learning curve, but it was fascinating and it has shaped my, um, my, my interest in this intersection between heritage and uh, web development and uh, digital storytelling. And second was trying to find alternatives to expensive software to uh, keep costs low. So I used a few different tools to help with this design, to help facilitate this design um, and assessment process. Uh, and we were able to keep uh, the costs quite, quite low as a, uh, thankfully. And some next steps. 
Uh, so David talked about this a little bit. Um, we're going to add more story content to, uh, to the website, um, the Byword Market kiosks and the Elgin Street uh, kiosks. Those stories um, are going to go up. Um, as well, uh, the website, you can access it. Um, but you might notice that some of the quick facts haven't been translated in French yet. Um, so that will be done. Uh, that will be done very soon, but it is not complete yet. Um, and then finally, uh, yeah, just collecting uh, Google Analytics data from the QR code scans to track high traffic areas and identify popular stories. So really trying to get more of a, an idea of public interest. Um, and before I wrap up, I'm just going to show uh, the quick facts section, uh, just a screenshot of that. This is what it looks like now. So that's what you see when you click on the page. And this is a um, screenshot of the map. So if you hover over a map point, you would click more details to access the story. And it shows just um, the location, a photo from the archival photo, and a little legend here. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great, thanks, Danielle. So um, yeah, that's been transformative for the website. And I'm just going to go back now and uh, wrap up. Um, apparently, you couldn't hear the or see the video. So I'm going to just play one a different video. I wanted to just try this. So I'm going to share this. Optimize for video clip share sound. So it Everything should have worked before. Um, does that work? It's working, but it's stalled. Yep, that's because I oh, stopped yeah, it to I'm check. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. okay, here we go. We're here today to launch the uh, project that was a partnership between the Carlton History Department and the NCC. So installations along the mechanical boxes uh, on Sussex Drive and tying those into some of Ottawa's sort of uncovered history. We are assigned a box and we had to try and find stories that were ideally geographically connected um, and then try and sort of personify that and make it appealing to a general audience. It's so exciting to watch um, all of this magic happen from um, primary materials and, and, and basic documentation. Everything looks amazing and I like how we were able to always see somebody represented at the NCC meetings. Um, that was really cool to have that human connection as well. I think the outcome is really unique. Clearly, it's uh, pretty dynamic to have um, utility boxes wrapped with stories. In all honesty, 35 years of teaching, this is the most spectacular result that I've ever experienced in, in a class project. I think there's a lot more avenues to put history in practice than we traditionally give credit for. It's, of course, really cool to be able to point at like a physical thing and be like, oh, hey, I did that. This is what real research collaboration means. It doesn't mean that the historians are the experts, it means that we're bringing one expertise to the table, and not all of those other expertises are just as important and just as valid. If it works, we end up with a spectacular result, and I have to say, I think this is a spectacular result. A lot of people go downtown and they'll see that box, and hopefully it resonates with a lot of people. Okay, I'm going to try and escape that, shut that down before something else starts. Um, take that down. Right, so um, I just want to wrap up here a little bit um, by just offering some concluding remarks. Um, the, oh, sorry about that. I embedded that video in the hope that it would work. Um, so, well, began as a community-centered experiential learning project for both MA students and, and um, undergraduate students has, has become this, this, this much more extensive um, uh, 
project. It uh, was something that was had very certain pedagogical goals. As a public historian, um, we're interested. Uh, public history is about how the public engages with the past in the public sphere, uh, in the public world. So we're interested in uh, interdisciplinary approaches, uh, collaboration, uh, partnerships, stakeholders, uh, pushing boundaries, telling stories in non-traditional ways. Um, all of those uh, group work and, and so on, all of those boxes were ticked with this experimental learning. What I learned especially was that um, what I be began thinking was going to be a collaborative project ended up being a, a, a co-production that um, everyone you see here, this is the launch of the um, Ottawa 17 uh, project. Someone, uh, the head of the Ottawa 2017 um, project is there. Um, the artist Ross Rayum is, is holding his painting. Members of the Workers' History Museum of the local BIA, uh, the Glee BIA from the media, um, Andre Mercer there standing beside the mayor, um, um, and so on. We. Uh, this ended up being a co-production, and that for me has been a real, really transformative experience as a historian, um, collaborating with others, but actually co-producing history with others. And uh, it's it's been joyful to see that um, excitement shared uh, among our students. And um, a special shout out is particularly to Danielle, because what was missing in this project until this year was a really dynamic and uh, a website. And uh, we now have that now. And uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful. And it keeps on growing. Um, we have been approached to do some more boxes, so we may not stop at 60, uh, at least until the city of Ottawa gets tired of us, maybe that might be. Um, the time this ends. So thanks very much everyone for listening uh, to our presentation and um, uh, we're happy to answer some questions or share some thoughts or Absolutely, I've go. got about uh, yeah. uh, five or six questions here if we've got a few minutes, David and Danielle, if you sure. want to take these. Uh, I'll start with this one because it sounds like an enthusiastic one. Someone wrote and says, how do we sign up for our neighborhood? He's talking about old Ottawa South. So is there a process that uh, community people can go through if they want to get a kiosk in their area. Yeah, um, on the final slide, I, we and I think um, Dylan posted it, there's capitalhistory.ca or connect with us, Dan, David Dean or Danielle, and uh, Danielle is a research assistant for the Center for Public History, and uh, we'll take it forward. Um, the, the general pattern of a process is for us to to meet with the, the, the people. Um, Elgin Street, take an example, um, sort out what the project entails, um, sort out some of the costs and the finances, and then we, we prepare um, a proposal for the City of Ottawa and we move forward there. Um, and uh, of course, this has to go through the approval process of the City of Ottawa. I'm not talking about the post-research design process, I'm talking about the initial approval. If they don't want to let us use their utility boxes, we won't. Um, I think, was that question from someone from Old Ottawa South? Yes. Uh, yeah, I live in Old Ottawa South, and I have to say that I almost caused an accident the other day because I was driving along and I saw this beautiful, perfect traffic control box, and I, <laughs> I wanted to tell a story there. And and uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's it, one of the troubling parts of this project is that I see canvases, blank canvases all across the city. And according to the city manager, there's 19,000 of them. So um, <laughs> there's there's a lot of, of potential. But Old Ottawa South has some fabulous stories to tell. And uh, I wanted to, you will have noticed that Bank Street project, um, the person who asked this question, uh, actually was started with Old Ottawa South, our neighborhood in Old Ottawa South, and told the story of where the um, Oat Couture is right now and the fire that was in that building. So, yeah. Okay, well, now that you say that there's 19,000 out there, that may, <laughs> may make this next question a move. I'll ask it anyways. Have you had a situation where you've had a site-specific story that you want to tell but can't get a traffic box close in that location? Absolutely. The Avalon Theatre is a perfect example of that. It's on the wrong intersection. The Avalon Theatre in, in the Glebe was where the home hardware is now. It's partly why the home hardware has two entrances, one on, on one of the avenues and one on bank. Um, 
we couldn't get, there's no box at that intersection, there's no traffic lights. So we had to tell it a, a block up. And so we have a little spin in the text panel where we say, <clears throat> if you move around onto the, onto the footpath, onto the pavement, onto the sidewalk and look down, you'll see down there, there's home hardware. Go down and visit it now because after you've read this story. Um, so yeah, the, there have been, there's a couple of moments I have to say that I've wanted to ask the city to put traffic lights in just so I can have a traffic control box to tell a story, but we are limited to that. Um, we have thought of alternatives. Um, there's some banners maybe um, as a possibility. A wall mural is another possibility that's come to us. And um, there's some other utility boxes around too um, that we may be able to, to use at some point. But at the moment, yes, there, there are some very frustrating uh, spots where there's a wonderful story to tell and there's no traffic box to tell it on. Well, maybe the city can take that into consideration next time they're putting traffic <laughs> yeah. approach lights on, they'll consider that. Someone else uh, comments, this is a wonderful project. Have you been approached by universities in other cities about copying what you're doing? Yes, I've been, um, I'm, I'm quite tied up Public History International, I edit an international journal and I'm on a steering committee of the International Federation of Public History, which has associations in many countries. So. Um, I, I go and give talks in places. So I was in Indonesia and um, I just had an email last week from a colleague in Jakarta to say that he's convinced the Jakarta local authority in one of his regions to do some of these installations there. And he's been sharing on, on um, Twitter and Facebook some of the archival images that his students have uncovered to tell those stories. Um, people in Italy have been interested in doing this there. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's something that is, is applicable everywhere there, where there's a traffic control box. And if you can get the uh, local authority and the interest in, it's possible. So yes, I, um, we gave, a, Andre and I gave a um, presentation at the Ontario BIA conference last week two weeks ago and uh, some of the other BIAs from other communities across Ontario were interested in, in this as well. And there's some similar projects, um, but different types of projects, but you know, you'll know you see these boxes increasingly uh, when you travel around uh, places. You'll see people are doing these in several cities and we, we, we're not sure we were the first, but we're certainly um, pleased that other people have seen value in what we're doing here. Yeah, definitely. Just I'm thinking in my neighborhood where I am, uh, they have artwork on the uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the traffic boxes, but they just seem to be random. Some of them are nice, but they just seem to be random. That'd be nice. Yeah, you know, we put in a bit. If is right. this Banyay? Uh, where, where I am in Mississauga, now Port Credit's got a lot oh, of history. Oh, Mississauga, they just right. yeah. Things randomly, yeah. but I'm thinking yeah. now that I've seen this talk, it would be nice to go back to them and suggest a, a nice theme yeah. of having all the boxes. Just that's even one just like one or two. Elgin Street, I find on Elgin mm -hmm. Street. Uh, now that, uh, yeah, there's a nice theme to all these kiosks. They're yeah. trying to get it quite well. Uh, I just noticed Dylan, Thanks, uh, Dylan just responded, 18,940 to go. <laughs> so keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, and another Thanks, one that Dylan. I want to consider, I hope people won't take it the wrong way, but I think it's a serious one. Uh, have you had a problem with vandalism with some of these? And what uh, what can you do if they do get tagged yeah. or yeah. Uh, defeated well, in some way? No, it's a, it's a great question. And it's the one that we're always asked every meeting by the city of Ottawa. And the statistics are, is that these boxes are vandalized less than other boxes. And it seems to be a bit like the, you will have all noticed the downtown BIA has some beautiful original art on some of their boxes, usually some sort of fashion uh, connection. And um, the city has found that those ones too, graffiti is, is not put on those boxes. People mm -hmm. seem to respect them. Um, we've had a couple of, a bit of tagging happen on a couple of the ones around the University of Ottawa. And um, we've had the mustache on the, uh, the lacrosse player, um, which was, it was the morning, morning of after St. Patty's night. And, um, I, I've, we've had very little report. We've lost boxes and had to replace them, but that's usually because someone has either hit it with a car or there's some technical issue that means the whole box has had to come out and be replaced with a different box. But no, we haven't had any vandalism yet. Um, and and yeah, it's it seems to be, it's, yeah, they seem to be fine. That's yeah. encouraging for other yep. BIAs who are thinking about it. That's Absolutely, really yeah. A question I should just ask for the general Ottawa. What is it with Ottawa and St. Patrick's Day? 
the town seems to have a big problem with <laughs> St. Patrick's Day. And then uh, I just have one last question that I want to ask. When I was going through your bio, a little bit off topic, but uh, well, maybe not. It says Dave is currently co-editing a book on Ottawa monuments. Mm. If you got a second, uh, uh, can you want to tell us about your book that's coming? Sure. Out? Well, there's some people, uh, Emma and Bruce, and who uh, John uh, uh, in the group here today, who are um, who have been part of that project. Um, it's I'm editing it with Tanya Davidson, who's a sociologist who wrote a PhD at Carleton and wrote a PhD on monuments. We were sitting having coffee in Black Squirrel one day in our my neighborhood, and uh, we both realized that what we wanted to do is do an encyclopedia of Ottawa's monuments with images, um, a critical approach so that uh, there's an individual author for each monument who's written it from a very certain perspective. Um, we've had you know, Tim Cook writing on the War Memorial. Mm -hmm. We've had Linda Tom writing about her monument to herself. Um, we've had the um, clary official clarion person at, at the Victoria Tower, uh, the Bells in Victoria Tower writing about that monument. Um, so we've got a great variety of authors um, and it's, it's an exciting book. It's coming out with McGill Queen's University Press. Um, and there are 84 monuments, uh, so, uh, in, uh, sorry, 84, 184 monuments that involved, I'm, I'm losing count now, but um, yeah, so it's, 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 if you know Peter Kaufman's book on the architecture of Ottawa, that, that guidebook, we, we sort of modeled it on that in a way, uh, it will be organized by neighborhood, and Danielle um, is going to be doing a interactive, creating an interactive map of the monuments for, for us. So it's been a wonderful journey. I've discovered monuments that I had no idea were there. Um, and and we, we've discovered lots of new ones. And uh, the stories, some of them are just fabulous. And uh, the writing's been terrific. But as you can imagine, um, my favorite show growing up in New Zealand was was the Sheep Herder, um, where it was a competition of, of uh, collies having to round up the sheep and get them in a pen and um, a sort of time competition. And there are moments where I felt like that, trying to round up you know, dozens and dozens of authors and their first drafts and their second drafts and their revised drafts. But on the whole, it's been a, well, I almost, it's been a fantastic experience. And um, yeah, it's an, uh, we hope it's, it's going to be a popular book or at least an interesting book for, for people to, to see. Mm -hmm. And we're pr probably out in 2024, I think now, okay. but um, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but it sounds like you and Danielle and others have had a, a really good time doing this, yeah. which yeah. is good. Because uh, yeah, I just want to say as we close off, I've been noticing them uh, again along Elgin Street, which has really needed them since all the construction that's going on. But up till now, I've just kind of taken it for granted that they were, you know, they're just there and you don't think about all the work that went into them. So I quite enjoyed this talk tonight because it made me realize, you know, these things just don't appear out of nowhere. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And yeah. I'm glad to see there's a lot of passion that goes into it too. So thank you, David. Oh, thank, you thank you for, it for a great talk tonight. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, and uh, we'll hope to see you again soon. Uh, well, I also want to thank Dylan for jumping in at the last minute to help solve some of our on-screen problems tonight. So thank you to everyone. Uh, and with that, I'll say good night. Our next meeting is Wednesday, October 27th at 7 p.m. And our guest speaker will be Emma Kent, who you've uh, heard from recently. And she will be talking about the British Home Child Movement, and she will share some excerpts from her grandfather's memoirs. So be sure to tune in two Wednesdays from tonight, Wednesday, October 27th. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.